Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There are some things that uh, we do every day. I would call them daily disciplines. A lot of them have to do with our health, our well-being. So maybe some of your daily disciplines might be getting out for a walk every day or doing some stretching exercises at home. Maybe it's brushing and flossing your teeth or just otherwise caring for your body. And you do it fairly regularly, maybe daily, daily disciplines. We also have some spiritual disciplines. And some authors have written that those spiritual disciplines may be disciplines of abstinence or engagement. The disciplines of abstinence would be things like fasting, so giving up food for a time or maybe even for a day, um, usually to spend time in prayer and to connect with God. There might be solitude or silence, so giving up or abstaining from community with other people, conversation. Um, even the Sabbath, our, our worship day, is it's a, a discipline of abstinence because we give up work on this day to spend time with God's people and in worship. The disciplines of engagement would be things that we do. So things like Bible reading or meditation, worship, prayer, service. A couple of Sundays ago, we heard about Jesus' custom of attending synagogue on the Sabbath. That was one of his spiritual disciplines. It was his custom each Sabbath to go to the synagogue. If we had went, gone back a couple more chapters in the book of Luke, we would find that when Jesus was 12, he and his parents went to the Passover in Jerusalem. And again, it says, according to their custom. So that was one of their spiritual disciplines, as many of the, the Jewish people of Jesus' day, to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. The application for uh, that spiritual discipline of uh, attending synagogue on the Sabbath is for us that here we receive a spiritual food that sustains us. Whether it's God's words of absolution, forgiveness spoken by the pastor that we hear and take to heart. Whether it's, as Luther said in his uh, catechism, that we gladly hear and learn God's word and use it as a guide and inspiration for our daily lives. Today, we also receive the Lord's Supper, Jesus' true body and blood for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. We are encouraged when using the words, for instance, of the Nicene Creed, we profess a common faith in our triune God. We join our voices in praise of God. We join our hearts in sincere prayers. And at the end of the service, we are sent out into our world with God's blessing. So that spiritual discipline of attending worship each week is something that strengthens us in our spirits for our life in this world. But today, I want to deal with the discipline that we heard in our gospel reading from the end of Luke 4. It was the discipline a solitude. Again, a discipline of abstinence, so being away from people. And it's paired with prayer, which is a discipline of engagement. I think a lot of you would agree when I say that life is busy. Life is busy. Whether it's work or food preparations at home, housework, laundry, yard and garden work, driving the kids or the grandkids around to all of their activities, whether it's that spiritual discipline or daily discipline of exercise or going to committee meetings and work, socializing, clubs, going grocery shopping or shopping for clothing. I come home at the end of the week, Friday night, I'm pretty bagged. Almost every week, life is busy. And that's why I generally take Saturdays as my day off. And that's so that I can be fresh and ready to go on a Sunday morning. One of the reasons that I'm bagged is that I think I actually do a whole lot more work these days in a typical week than I did 30 years ago as a young pastor. In those days, I had to actually type my sermons on a typewriter. 
I was just thankful that I had a brother corrector writer. I don't know if you can envision what that was, but it had this extra little uh, ribbon, which was like white out. And so you could backspace and retype over the letter that you made a mistake on and then just keep on going. But it took a lot longer to type out a sermon than it does these days. Now I can just do corrections and additions and deletions on the fly on the computer. And in those days, if I wanted to communicate with people, I had to phone them. Multiple people on a landline. Maybe even with a rotary phone. You know how long it takes to dial one number with a rotary phone. And I'd have a longer conversation with people like, Hi, how are you doing? How's your family? How's your week going? Then finally you'd kind of get down to the reason for your call. Now, I can send out emails to multiple recipients at a time. So I can get more done. I didn't have a secretary back in the olden days. I was the only employee of the church. So I had to do all the correspondence, all the annual reports, prepare the bulletin, everything. Now I can delegate some of that stuff, have other people do it, and that means I actually get more done because I can do more pastoral ministry things. And we all have machines that help us to get our work done. Dishwashers, washing machines. I heard people talking about getting their snow blowers out this afternoon. Oh, I hope not. I don't think so. But it seems like we have all these things that make it like we get more accomplished every day and every week. Because of those time-saving devices, we simply just add more things to our to-do list every week. Life is busy. Life is busy. And you know, for some people, that seems to be a praiseworthy state of being. People somehow seem proud to say that they are busy. Even retirees, I've heard retirees say, I have so much to do now that I'm retired that I don't know how I ever found time to work. But busyness can actually prevent us from being in relationship with others. You know, we're running so fast that we don't have time for people. We're running so fast that we maybe don't have time for God. Let me tell you that, I, and I will say this to you, even though I'm not your official called pastor, um, if you need some time from me or from Vicar Peter to talk about God, to talk about spiritual things, maybe spiritual disciplines, please, please know that for a pastor, people, people are their real ministry. So even if I'm running fast, you are my ministry. You are Peter's ministry. And we will make time for you. We promise. What do we see Jesus doing in Luke 4 today? Being busy. I don't know if you remember what we read. He was teaching the Capernaum synagogue on the Sabbath. He was casting an evil spirit out of, that same, out of a man in that same synagogue. He was healing Peter's mother-in-law from a fever. And at sundown... He was healing all kinds of people who were being brought to him with sicknesses and casting out demons. Those are busy days for Jesus. He must have been exhausted. Because remember, he was human. He was God, but he was also human. There's another episode where Jesus was so tired that he was sleeping in a boat with his disciples. And how did Jesus recharge? There's a very simple verse in our gospel reading today, verse 42, where it says that at daybreak, Jesus went out to a desolate place, away from the people, just by himself. After all of that people time all day, perhaps like an introverted person, Jesus just needed some quiet time, some alone time, away from people, in order for him to focus, to concentrate, to connect with his heavenly Father, to remember his mission, maybe to plan, to process, and to pray. Luke's gospel doesn't tell us that Jesus prayed, but Mark's account of this same story does say that Jesus went out to that solitary place where he prayed. But we don't know if Jesus did this every day, but it was certainly part of his routine, his custom. Maybe it was a weekly discipline, just as the Heavenly Father rested on the seventh day after six days of creation. But if you read the Gospel of Luke, Luke mentions several times 
that Jesus went away to pray. He was praying at his baptism. Some 20 verses after today's reading in Luke chapter 5, we read that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In Luke 6, we hear that Jesus spent the whole night praying on a mountain. Twice in Luke 9 and once in Luke 11, Jesus was praying either alone or with his disciples. And Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night when he was betrayed. And then he went farther and he prayed alone. And that's where we read that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He was already experiencing that sorrow of bearing the weight of our sins. So we often see Jesus in solitude, modeling that spiritual discipline for us. Solitude, being away from people, spending some time in prayer. Just like the Sabbath or our Sunday is a chance for us to step aside from the busyness of our daily work, so solitude is a chance for us to step aside from the busyness of people and to just calm our minds, to decompress, to connect with God. When was the last time you just sat somewhere in silence and solitude? Maybe it was looking at the mountains, the trees, the river, clouds, or at night, even the stars. When was the last time you just rested in God's presence? When was the last time you took a personal retreat or attended a retreat? Life seems to be too busy to be doing those kinds of things. We're not self-disciplined when it comes to solitude. It was almost exactly 12 years ago. It was in February of 2007. I remember attending a pastor's spirituality retreat. It was, it was like three or four days long. Um, I don't know why, but they planned it for Phoenix. So I had to go down to Phoenix for this pastor's retreat in February. Um, but I remember the pastor who led at least part of it. His name was Walt Weiser. I remember his, his name. And he encouraged us pastors and we're no different from you, let me tell you. It's hard to have a discipline of ha having that alone time and prayer time. He encouraged us pastors to consider what we might do to connect with God on a regular basis. Have some of that self-discipline. And he asked us to kind of write out our plan, what we thought we could do. And then he said two things. One is, put, begin to put your plan into practice within 48 hours of getting home. And he said, practice it for 20 days in a row, and it will become a custom. It will become a practice or a discipline. And so, as I thought about what I might do that I wasn't already doing, I thought I needed to spend some time each day in, in prayer. And I thought about Jesus' words in Matthew 6, where he says, you know, when you pray, go someplace quiet where you're, and, and kind of close the door um, and where your Heavenly Father knows that you're there and, and spending that time with him. I've always envisioned it as kind of like a prayer closet. So uh, our house in Calgary at the time, our, none of our kids were at home anymore. And, and our house in Calgary had a bedroom in the basement and the closet in that bedroom did not have a door on it. So it was just kind of open. And I thought, well, that's a perfect place to call my prayer closet. So I got my uh, a good comfy chair. I stuck it in there. I got a little TV tray or stand and put a lamp there. I got my devotion booklets. And that's what I did. I'd spend like half an hour or 45 minutes before my wife got up and uh, spent that time in reading God's word and prayer. And although I don't do it every day, it's still a discipline for me. It's something that I practice virtually every day of the week. Going into my prayer closet, I don't have the same prayer closet as I did then, but going into my quiet space and just spending that time in reading God's word and praying. Whether it's uh, maybe a seasonal retreat that you might take or a daily prayer closet, I think we can really benefit from that quiet, solitary time with God.
First, just kind of putting the distractions and the busyness of life behind us for a time, and then listening and being recharged and strengthened, being reminded of our identity as God's beloved children, calling to mind our various vocations as a spouse or a parent, a worker, a neighbor, being guided and inspired in the Christ-centered purposes of our lives. Consider, consider that for yourselves, a time of solitude. Maybe it's just five or ten minutes each day, or one hour each week, or maybe one day, once or twice a year, to leave those earthly things behind and to seek out God in silence and in prayer. I truly believe you will be blessed by those times. Our spiritual disciplines, whether they are this prayer and solitude, whether it's coming to worship each Sunday, they don't contribute to our salvation. So I'm not telling you to do that because God's going to favor you any more than he already does. Solitude and prayer are not the source of your salvation. They will simply be times for you to connect with God. But I want to tell you about one other time of solitude for Jesus, and that was his alone time on the cross. He was all alone there because the disciples deserted him and fled. He was all alone there because even his heavenly father had forsaken him. He was all alone. And there he endured the punishment for the sins of the entire world. So that now... There is no condemnation for you. There's no condemnation for you. All alone, Jesus rose from the dead, having defeated not just a random demon here or there, like we heard in the gospel lesson today, but triumphantly conquering our enemies of sin and death and hell. In the gospel reading today, after Jesus' time of solitude, the people found him again. They pressed on him. They brought their needs to him. They brought their desires before him. But after some quiet time off, it was for him right back to the busyness. His reply to those people is significant. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God, for I was sent for this purpose. In fact, it was more than just preaching the good news that was Jesus' purpose. It was being the good news. We heard Jesus say recently that he was fulfilling the message from Isaiah. Not just preaching good news, but bringing freedom for prisoners, the prisoners of sin, and also proclaiming the Lord's favor. That was Jesus' mission. That was Jesus' purpose. Because he died, and especially because he rose from the dead, I want to proclaim to you God's favor today. God forgives you. God loves you. God is preparing a place for you in heaven. That's something for us to think about, and reflect on, and rejoice in. Both in solitude and in the company of our fellow believers. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.